Dark times call for heroes. Our cities are battlegrounds. Our suburbs are no longer safe. Will you answer the call? S5E is a superheroic role-playing game designed for 5th edition. It brings you and your team of heroes to the front line of the fight. Whether you're tracking down a villainous thief, fighting against a sinister high-tech corporation, or destined to fight against the world-ending threat of an alien invasion, S5E is your way to tell that story. Suncoast Port was once a bustling, sandy, sun-drenched city, full of tourists, beachgoers, and movie stars. For years, Suncoast City stood as the shining gem of the West Coast, and superheroes flocked to the famous city. But light cannot exist without darkness. S5E is set against the dark and mysterious backdrop of Midnight City. Upon these streets, your heroes are forged with fire and instilled with hope and strength though it may not be enough. Midnight City, written by Alan Barr, takes the Iron Age of comics and applies the tone to a four-color setting, providing a locale where street-level vigilantes, magicians, and paragons of hope mingle in an attempt to take back the city and break a sorcerer's spell. It's just one of the exciting world-building tools S5E provides. S5E is a 300-page guide loaded with exciting new content that brings all the action from comics and movies to your 5th edition game. With this rulebook, you have all you need to create, equip, and play the superhero of your dreams. Whether you're a lone vigilante, a cosmic powerhouse, or the mother of all street fighters, S5E has you covered. Along with the core rulebook is the Midnight City setting book. The rich, detailed world of Midnight City waits for you and your team to assemble. Finally, there is the Augmented Operative Registry, a monster manual brimming with super soldiers, villains, criminals, and monsters all ready to face off against your team. The Augmented Operative Registry catalogs over a hundred super-powered beings, both friendly and dangerous. Whatever story you want to tell, the AOR has allies, foes, threats, and mysteries you need. Happy Sunday, folks. Welcome to our S5E live stream. We are joined today by some of the creators of this awesome new project, Lisa, Gwen, and Aaron. And we might even get a surprise guests later on, too, just in case. But the, uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Hey. Hi. Hello. So as that awesome little me, I turn the little video clip down. As the awesome video uh, from the Kickstarter explained, S5E is a new superheroic role-playing system for 5th edition, the uh, world's most popular role-playing game system. So uh, let's get started with uh, Gwen, because I think Gwen uh, took a major lead on the development of this project. Tell us, um, Gwen, what, introduce yourself. Uh, tell us about your, uh, your history in gaming. How did you get into gaming? What was your first D&D experience? Uh, what was your favorite uh, superhero? All that good stuff. All right, great. Hi, uh, I'm Gwen Marshall. Uh, I am the lead designer and author of the core S5B rulebook and some of the other content in the uh, Augmented Operatives Registry and other things. Um, I got into d and in 82, uh, around the same time that it was back big in the zeitgeist, right? So like E.T., the cartoon, it was on end caps and B. Dalton, you know, which is probably where my parents picked it up and got it for me for Christmas. And I played it and loved it. But interestingly, pretty quickly, that was the Beck Me red cover box basic set. But quit it, pretty quickly, I switched actually to superhero games and started playing Villains and Vigilantes and Heroes Unlimited, rolling up random powers, you know, getting my, my first hero was I rolled up, got Crustacean Powers. <laughs> but, uh, man, that's a great tie. Like we're running a, a, a Pine Box Middle School uh, Kickstarter at the moment, and there's a Doberman Pinscher who is a Doberman dog with crustacean claws on the front. Total dad <laughs> joke. Um, so your your crusty superhero is um, a welcome addition uh, mm. to the tale. As for superhero properties, well, I grew up being a Marvel fangirl, so mm -hmm. Spider Man probably was the one that spoke to me the most. You know. Yeah, good, 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 good. So uh, let's go around the clock. Aaron, sir, welcome, welcome. Um, 
the uh, you know uh, pinnacle people will recognize you, but the um, give an introduction for folks who uh, might be new to S five E and uh, and give us your history. Like, how'd you get into gaming? What was your first D and D experience? And what is your favorite super property or hero? Okay, uh, so I'm president of Sigil Entertainment. So I I wrangle all of our projects. Um, we st we've started off with uh, Savage Sign, which Savage fans are probably familiar with. Well, we did a couple of editions of that, and and then we moved into some 5e stuff. And and S5e is certainly our, our largest and uh, flagship uh, property at the moment. Um, I got into gaming in '79. I'm dating myself. <laughs> uh, I saw some uh, some older kids playing it at a friend's house, and. Um, decided that it, it looked awesome and so me and my friends decided to play without having any of the books or anything so we would really we were just making maps and like describing which direction to go <laughs> until we actually you know got a book and figured out how to actually play but it was a lot of fun and i've been hooked ever since i played just about everything um you know vigil villains and vigilantes marvel superheroes uh, champions of course um Indiana Jones, Top Secret, everything back then, you know. Uh, any any role-playing game I could get my hands on, I played. Um, I think uh, I'm also a, a Marvel fanboy, so with Gwen, I think Spider-Man was, like, the, the one that spoke to me the most. Um, but my, my first uh, Villains and Vigilantes character was a terrible Wolverine knockoff. <laughs> Uh, which I mean, you know, if, if you're in the Marvel school, you can't avoid uh, Wolverine. He is he's the bread and butter, right? And uh, and he's, he's a, it's a you know, if you're gonna have a knockoff, it's cool to have a Wolverine. Uh, in fact, my first D and D character was a uh, Aragorn knockoff named Stalker. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's that's true. I mean, who who did it? Who did not have the Aragorn knockoff his first time you played? It's like, and that was that was the thing for me with D and D was like. It didn't. It's it's a very different fantasy than Tolkien. It really is not the same genre. Now that was my first uh, clash of like realizing, like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This ain't this. You know, tried to tried to play the Aragorn, and it's like that, that's not how this game works. This is a totally different <laughs> right? fantasy. But we'll get into that more later. Thanks. Oh, and then you've got some two new puppies. We're going to be introduced to later. Yeah, right? if you can, you probably hear them. They're back there biting each other in the face oh they're so cute they're so cute. we will get them on camera we promise people there will be puppy time yeah i'll bring them um, out but before that uh lisa smedman welcome to the stream sure, Madam, thanks tell for us, having me. absolutely the um so tell us um how, how did you get into writing and gaming and what's your favorite property in supers and now uh, what, what, what are your contributions to s5e and all that good stuff sure sure yeah i got into uh tabletop minis gaming way back when I was very young. Um, but in terms of RPGs, um, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons got into that in 1980, um, was in a game where my very first character was a hobbit. I got turned into stone. I couldn't do anything for the rest of the game. They picked <laughs> me up and used me as a battering ram to knock down doors. But even so, I was hooked and ran mm -hmm. out and bought that red box and started DMing right off the bat. Um, uh, and very soon thereafter, got into um, designing. Um, had a couple things come out in um, Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine back in the day. Started working for TSR, then WotC, then Hasbro. The paycheck comes from different people over the decades. And um, also did um, some work for Shadowrun and the original Cyberpunk. And um, oh, gee. Uh, wrote a bunch of novels um, for Forgotten Realms um, and continued to, um, you know, play uh, RPGs on a regular basis. Um, uh, my gaming group currently is revisiting the um, original Dragonlance. Can oh, nice. That, you Jealous. know, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and eagerly anticipating the, the new release of that. Uh, in terms of superheroes, I like kind of, oddball stuff um, and quirky characters, um, you know, Umbrella Academy or... Um, oh, it's so good, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, uh, or, or, you know, supers that explore other cultures like Black Panther, or um, I'm a huge fan of alternate history. I write 
that sort of thing. And so I really enjoyed um, a product called Red Sun, S-O-N, um, yes. that was what if Superman had landed in the Soviet Union and been raised I remember there. That, yeah. Yeah. And the art for that was great too. I mean, I oh, it's gorgeous, that. Yeah. gorgeous stuff. Um, so yeah, and then you know, have played D and D through all the various editions, mm -hmm. and um, now of course I'm playing uh, fifth edition. And uh, yeah, so you know, heard about this project, jumped on board happy to be designing superhero stuff now <laughs> yeah, i mean great. you've got such an enviable resume on, on some of these greatest properties uh totally jealous i think it's all for all three of you i think it's great that it's it sounds like the theme for the first question this this uh lazy sunday is you guys are getting paid to live the dream of stuff that you oh, started yeah. 30 years ago i mean that's just you know it's so rare in this industry it's not it's not that big of an industry right there aren't that many jobs to go around but right um as long as i got you lisa before i i swing back around around to gwen is What's it like? What's the difference between writing? You mentioned like novels and you wrote novelizations. Um, what's the difference in writing between like writing a novel where you have total control of the plot and then writing for an RPG where you kind of have to hand over your cool ideas to someone else to run and, and have the randomness? What's the, what's the difference in the process like for that? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting one. I, I also teach um, game design at a local college and um when I'm teaching um, quest design, I have students who are writing their quest like a story. And I'm like, okay, this is a story, this isn't an adventure. And so what I'm constantly doing with them is saying, okay, where does the player make a choice? Where does the player make another choice? They're not gonna go out of this doorway and run down the hallway like you tell them to. They might go somewhere <laughs> else entirely. You might need a few locked doors in there. Um, so it's it's the same process in terms of generating a backstory and characters and a possible plot, but a plot that you're constantly thinking of, you know, ways it can branch in 50 different directions, possibly. Um, so that's the key difference, really. Yeah. Oh, great answer. I think that's an answer that like, I think my middle school, high school and like college game master needed to hear. And it's like, <laughs> you're not writing the story and making your players like act it out for you. You are not a playwright. You're a game yeah. master. And um, so you still need to have the creativity and the ideas, but you don't get to determine where it goes. That's what those right. players. So the, uh, so Gwen to you, um, What's it? What's it like writing for for fifth edition with a, you know, ostensibly a system designed for fantasy? Um, but you, you know, we've added all these tools with S five E to run a very different genre and very different kind of expectations. So, what's the the process like there, and how have you adapted um, uh, the superheroes for S five E or for, for fifth edition? I should say. Oh, you muted. Oh, we muted you. Sorry, dear. <laughs> Not back yet. Oh. No. Oh, let's see, it's not oh, on our end. We lost her. How did this happen? Why are we having technical difficulties? I want to know the answer, Quinn. No, that's the yeah, that's the physical one. Log off no. today. <laughs> no, we lost you. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a couple minutes to figure out what's going on there. I'll go to Ace in the meantime, and when you get back, just okay. let us know. So Ace, sir, before we get the amazing answer from Gwen, um, tell me about the visuals. The art is, is amazing. I'm a big fan. It's got a very unique style. Um, so tell us about kind of the, the that aspect of S5E. Like how, how important is it to get – the art right and the tone right and all that good stuff. So oh, I think it's super important. Um, luckily, my job was Hello. super easy. <laughs> Yay. Because we, we have a couple of really great pencilers in Jimbo Salgado and Ian Flores. They're just pros and they um, put some great material together for us. Um, and and I, just, I just love their work. So I was just lucky, to, lucky get to get them, and they're on board for the for the line. So we look forward to more good art from them. I think that's what a really crucial thing with publishing, especially. I mean, the hard part about supers, right, is you can't just do two or three pieces of art to give people the tone. 
you, all, you need pictures of all the different types of, of kind of heroes. And there are so many people will want to play. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, you know, you, you don't get away easy with the, oh, we, we, can, we can afford to just do a couple pieces and get to the Kickstarter. And, and, no. And then the fact that you're able to keep the same artists on to the whole project and that consistency and that level. I mean, I love the big bad. I don't know his story, but the fact that he's got these like two ancient tomes tied together with a, a chain. Like, I need to know that story. I, I want to pick up the books and find out, like, who are we really going against in kind of the first campaign. So um, now that we've got Gwen back. Hey. Madam, back to so, you. Okay, so... In order to make 5e work with superheroes, you have to kind of, I had to identify what doesn't fit, right? What parts of D&D don't fit well in the superhero genre. And the big one really is that D&D is traditionally based on uh, mechanics of scarcity. It's about tracking hit points. It's about tracking arrows, um, running out of rations, uh, running out of spell slots. But the issue is when Human Torch says flame on and shoots a bad guy, and then another bad guy comes around a corner five minutes later, if he were to say, sorry, I'm out of spell slots, that's just not very heroic, right? So right from the get-go, the biggest thing we wanted to do was to uh, it was to take those mechanics out, the scarcity-specific ones. Because it just so happens, a little secret under the hood about 5e, is that Jeremy Crawford, lead rules designer for WotC, has admitted that actually the game is balanced as if every player character will use all of their most powerful abilities every combat. So I thought, well, then let them do it, right? It's just that simple. It's just as if you're going into every combat fresh. You don't run out of spell slots because they're, well, they're power slots now. And as you power up, you can just cast fireball every round if you're powerful enough. But of course you can. You're a superhero, right? So that, and then we wanted to lean into more collaborative teams because an adventuring party is supposed to cooperate. But as you all know, in D&D, <laughs> it'll be the bard is chatting away or whatever. And everybody's just sitting back, maybe... You know, but in a superhero game, you have combo moves and people team up together. So we created mechanics for uh, team uh, combo moves and a team morale score that builds up. And then if you want to have this sort of thing, everyone combines their powers in a big combo super move, that sort of stuff. So just adding a few extra tools to give it that flavor and to take out and then remove the distinctively fantasy dungeon grind sort of feel. Uh, really, because let's be honest, wizards did all, some of the work already. Your higher level fantasy heroes are basically superheroes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that, like the, the combo and the team up, because I mean that that is one thing that is super important in the tropes and expectations and it's trope in a good way, right? People have used trope now; they think it's a bad word. It's like no, it's just a neutral word, guys. The um, but I, I love the, the expectation of, of the team up. Um, maybe maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that because that's I think just a, a super. I mean, uh, it's a super part of supers. Um, <laughs> they, they, I know I'm, I'm. I don't have kids with dad jokes or just like that. So the. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, that's a, really kind of an important distinction between like I, I think in fantasy, you know, where you've got role. Like protection and niche protection, and you know, there's a tank, and, and then and, you know, the, the, the distance people are a little like glass candy, so they hide behind the tank, and all these kind of things. Whereas in supers, there really is that tag team combined effort mechanic that really doesn't get you know, uh, it doesn't come to the fore in fantasy. Mm-hmm. So maybe just talk a little bit more about that, and like, how, how do you accomplish that? Like, do players roll together? Do they give bonuses? What's the the actual um, the crunch on that? so? Two things I just wanted to mention. You talked about role like niche protection, right? Yeah. So the way in which um, we kind of accomplish that, co- account for that in S five E is there's every superhero basically has what in D and D would be a spell list, right? Mm-hmm. So your blaster has like the elementalist spell list, and the kinetic is the big strong or fast person. But all of the heroes have access to a general powers list, so everybody can be tough or can fly or whatever. Um, great sight because all kinds of different heroes have that but then there's the specialty ones that really give it the flavor so that's one way we kind of allow for that diversity of powers but with regards to the team up moves in particular you there's a pool called the team morale and you build up it by taking the help action in combat so if you use your action to assist an, an ally in combat you get one point in the team morale or if you roll a um a natural 20 you get to put one in and there's a few powers that let you manipulate this pool as well. And once it reaches the number, once that team morale pool reaches the number of players at the table, so if you've got four players, and once it gets to four, anybody can 
you, uh, declare on their turn, let's do a team up move. And if everyone agrees, you cash in those points and then every single player at the, at the table gets a free action to take an attack or use a power, but they just, and then the flavor part of it is they're supposed to describe how them doing so is combining with at least one other player at the table to create the effect. So this allows for, if they want to do like a Power Rangers, Gachaman style, everyone combines into one big attack, they can. Or if you want to do more like a, you know, like, um, you know, throwing Wolverine at the fastball special, <laughs> then you just have the two, right? The strength guy and the this blade you know the wolverine gets thrown and then you just add you double the you know damage rolls basically so each person uses their power and you add it all up the nice part about this is it is it's op of course it is but it's supposed to be and but how do you get it by collaborating with your fellow player because that's something that dnd struggles with really mm -hmm. is team players playing at each other instead yeah. of at the, the the game master and so this way, you're always thinking like, well, I want to build that up so we can go Nova on the big bad. So it promotes caring about that sort of thing, right? Uh, it's a super elegant mechanic. I, I think it sounds fantastic. I mean, just the, I, 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 I can just see at the table when you're, you're in a dire situation and you're one point short of being able to do the team mechanic. And then the, the guy who's going, the girl who's going, rolls that natural 20 and gives you that extra point. Um, mwah. Like that's, you know, th those are, those are some things like, you know, my native system is Savage Worlds and, and exploding dice is, you know, or a joker. So I mean, those are things mm -hmm. where people at the table will cheer. I can see right. people at the table cheering when you get that natural 20 and, and, and you're not then getting depressed by having to confirm it, all that kind of stuff. You're literally, that's, that 20 gives you that one more point you need into your pool. And then everybody, you know, has the option of getting involved in like kind of the, the big mechanic um that's fantastic i that that oh it sounds great i want to play it now i really want to you know that's and, and you're you're really right about you know I mean, that's kind of the, the big question right is it like if you're going to do supers do you do you build a system that is designed from the, the ground up to do supers but then again like there's so many players out there who won't get the chance to play you know um you know, to, to transition into all of our other little game systems that, that are that are not right. 5e Right. And, and so doing supers in 5e, I think, does a real service to the, the, the new and burgeoning fan base that's out there who you know, enter the hobby. Because, I mean, all three of you mentioned, you know, uh, either entering the hobby or very early in the hobby, you know, dealing with Dungeons and Dragons. Right. And and the you know, the, the listen to your resumes, you've all gone on to write for very different properties um, and even you know, different supers games. So you know, there's there's more out there than just 5e. Um, but having that 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 that. That way to, to do it. I already know 5e. Can I learn a few more mechanics and then be able to play supers? That's just a, that's a super awesome thing to, to bring to the industry. So the um, I'll, I'll switch to Ace, sir. On that, what's what's kind of the challenges of, of, of being a multidisciplinary game designer and manager? Is it, I mean, you know, getting mechanics stuck in your head or you know, the <laughs> <Absolutely. audience? laughs> I, I played so many systems now. I, in fact, Gwen can attest to this. When I run, I'm like, hmm, "Was this? Which edition was this rule from?" Yeah. Oh, let's just wing it. But yeah, yeah it, it, it sometimes can get confusing if you know you're so used to doing so many different systems. Um, keeping it all together is a is a challenge for sure. Yeah. So so on 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 this project, the the Kickstarter was fantastic. You guys did an awesome job. I, I'll, I'll probably pull up the page here in a second. Uh, but it's available now, right? The books are coming out. We're uh, the, all yeah, give, give us the the, the the timeline for like where, where are they at the printer, all that kind so, of stuff. Yeah, all the books are at the printer. Um, the digital rewards have been released. Um, Kevin Kevin Andrew Murphy is working on the last stretch goal story that we uh, we unlocked, and um, yeah, and you can back right now on Backer Kit and and get all the PDFs uh, right away. So yeah, so for folks who haven't, let me see if I can pop up, up on screen. So the um, uh, since the Kickstarter, Sigil has officially joined the Pinnacle family. I mean, you guys were here all along, anyways, uh, but you just made things a little more official. And um, so let me pop it up just just in case folks want to grab this because we were talking about it. The um, let's see, share screen. How many windows do I have open? Here we go. So on the Peg Inc. website, if you go to peginc.com, there's a new banner right here. Right below New to Savage Worlds is Sigil Entertainment Products. And you can hit the shop now right there. And uh, that'll open up all of the Sigil products 
that are going on. And so you can see like Gwen, you can talk about some uh, ancestry and culture because um, that is an award winning um, product that is now under, uh, under our uh, umbrella. And um, on this page, so we will have the um, S5B products up here very soon it's for pre-order because like right now it's kind of in a pledge manager state. So we'll get it on our website and um, but we'll give you guys links on here to the pledge manager. I don't have it here now, but I will. And um, so you guys can pick up the, the PDFs that are ready and then we can get to the um, uh, uh, the actual physical books when they come in. So we're very excited to see those come in um, soon. So Lisa, um Give us a little hint about like what what work you've done on S5B. Like, uh, do you have a favorite villain, a favorite storyline, a favorite location? Like, you know, tell us about about kind of what you you've worked on so far in this in this new um, IP. Sure, sure. Well, I was brought on board to flesh out a world and um, create some adventures within it. Um, the working title is Earth Alpha. And um, so this is a collection of new stuff, um, you know, new subclasses, new powers, new stuff, basically aliens. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say without oh, spoilers, but I'll try and keep it. Give us a know. few, give us a yeah. few. It's, it's trick or treat Jeez. time. Sure, sure. Um, well, there's uh, aliens on Earth. Um, people have a, have awoken to have these superpowers. Um, there's um, Atlantis was real. Um, there's Atlanteans using um, something called aura cal or a chalcum. Um, this maybe it's a crystal, maybe it's a metal, maybe it's organic. We're not sure to. Um, basically create unlimited energy sources. Um, uh, the superheroes are um, part of something called the uh, Department of Alien Operations, which is based DAO. Um, so think kind of men in black-ish. Um, and the campaign revolves around um, beginning supers getting recruited, getting to know each other, figuring out their roles on the team. So a fair bit of work went into um, designing a session zero for the players to get to know one another and figure out who they are and how they feel about each other. And then off you go on a series of adventures um, revolving around that dude you mentioned with the textbooks on chains <laughs> and uh, a search for an ancient spell book and the scattered pages thereof. And uh, you'll even be bouncing around a little bit in time. So, um, oh. Oh. yeah, so all oh, kinds of weird and wonderful, cool things are happening. And so it's it's part of it is designed for the players, you know, the, the new subclasses and so on. Part of it is designed for the GM. So there's a little bit of something in there for um, for everyone. Oh, that, that's fantastic. So I, I noticed, uh, so we're going to bring Kevin on here in a second when his camera gets on. So Kevin, just check the sprocket settings below and we'll get your camera working. And um, but you and Gwen are both also professors and teachers. Um, so that's that's a cool little link. Um, any insight on what it's like to what what tools um, do you use when you're playing as a player or as a game master that you've uh, worked out as a professor? Is there maybe there's there's got to be some some knowledge there that we can uh, um, we can glean from you guys. So any 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 tips from the prof, so to speak? Lisa, would you like to go or should I, shall I go first? Oh, you go first. Okay. Um, so I'm not a game design professor. I'm a philosophy mm -hmm. professor, weirdly. But um, it, two things. One is I've spent the past 20 years explaining weird philosophical concepts to 18-year-olds. So explaining <laughs> game mechanics is actually, in clear, straightforward language, is a very useful skill that isn't as common as you'd expect. Um, also, I run discussion groups every class. And that's about directing traffic and just keeping pacing and uh, attention and focus. And that's really very similar to what a game master does, right? They're, they're not supposed to be the center of attention. They're supposed to be facilitating a fun or learn, you know, pedagogical experience among the students and trying to create conditions for the students to uh, engage. And that's what you do with players in a, in a good game too. Oh, good answer. Good answer. Yeah, and certainly, you know, an instructor's skills, it's like, oh, the class is fading. Time to switch gears, folks. We're going to do this. 
So same thing with players. Yep, time for combat. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when in doubt, spice things up. <laughs> we, um, no, that, that's great. The um, Awesome. So let's get Kevin on. I don't think Kevin's camera's working quite yet, but hopefully we'll see if his audio is working. Kevin, can you hear us? Um, I can hear you fine. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So okay. the, uh, you get to be mysterious yep. for the time being, which is good. It's cool. It's super. <laughs> There's the man behind the the, 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 uh, the screen. So, um, Kevin, before we were talking about, um, well, let's get a little introduction from you. So I'm going to throw like three questions at you and you can kind of work them into your answer. But um, how did you get into gaming, sir? Uh, what are your favorite super properties or heroes? And um, what's it like developing for fifth edition? So uh, we'll toss it to you to introduce yourself and let us know what you how, what you've done so far on this project. Okay. Well, how I got into gaming, um, like many people, um, I started <clears throat> with Dungeons and Dragons years ago when I was in high school. And that was actually my first in intro to the industry where I had my very first uh, publication was for Dragon Magazine so many issues ago um, where I did an article on wishes. And that was like, that came out when I was 21. Actually, I sold it when I was 21, and then it came out two years later when I was in grad school. <laughs> if, if people who aren't in the industry don't realize, sometimes things you create sit in, in a producer's, you know, inbox for, for years before they finally see the light of day, which it's, I mean, that could be a little frustrating, but continue, yeah. sir, continue. <clears throat> and to see, I wrote some for Talislanta and stuff, got in with White Wolf and uh, with uh, Stuart Wick. And then I also, uh, at the same time, got jumped into the gang by George R. R. Martin for Wild Cards because I wrote uh, the first or the second uh, Derp's Wild Cards book, Aces Abroad. And sort of very, very long story short, I even got to uh, finally use some of the characters for, for that for uh, Wild Card stories because I've been went from being the 23 year old newcomer into the gang to all the way up to you know current day now i'm considered one of the veterans the um awesome so what 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 favorite um are you marvel you dc you dark horse what's your favorite kind of comics genre or character or any anything in that what uh what what brings you to the supers uh, genre in specific um i will definitely say i'm i'm a marvel uh, type uh grew up started reading you know tons of x-men but i also like Lots of the odd old comics. Uh, there was like Normal Man, which was an independent thing that I like start. I think I started with collecting because uh, I was a new comic when I was like 18. And then there was uh, some of the old EC comics uh, were, were fun. And uh, Metal Men, that, that was an interesting one. <laughs> oh, perfect. So the um, so tell us what, what has been your contribution to S5E? Um, well, it started with me with a lot of the fiction, so I did The Covenant of Six, and I'm doing The Union of the Seven right now, which is, you know, I'm halfway through, I'm just finishing up Winchester's uh, story, and I've also been doing a whole lot of the world building where, you know, I the one who came up with the Orichalcum, and, you know, we're you know, trying to make sure that there's a magical explanation behind things that is also of course a mad science explanation oh good stuff good stuff so the um i'll go around for for uh the the, the, the group um so aaron what's better heroes or villains what's more compelling what's more interesting writing for designing for um heroes or villains for you um hard to say hard to say i i sure like my villains um so I'm gonna have to go with the villains. Okay, one for villains. Yeah, Doctor Doom. <laughs> Good. The um, <laughs> so Chad agrees. Chad agrees. Villains. Um, Lisa, for you, interest on in writing, designing, or running villains or heroes? Sure. For me, heroes. Um, there's this wonderful transition point when they become heroes, and especially if they're flawed heroes. Or if they suddenly have a revelation about what they're doing, maybe it's not the good thing. Um, that really intrigues me. Mm. Good answer, good answer. Okay, Kevin, back to you quickly. I know, <laughs> soon, not quickly. You can take all the time you need for the answer. Heroes or villains, sir? Mm. 
Uh, honestly, I, I like villains who think that they're heroes. <laughs> there you go. Clever <laughs> answer. Clever answer. Mag yeah, Magneto. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's true, right? I mean, I think I think that makes for more compelling stories that last mm -hmm. longer too. So it's hard to be just pure evil, but if you've got a sense, if you have a character who has a sense that they're doing the right thing ultimately, um, even if it's horrific or they just have a different value set that's you know not compatible with the rest of humanity, um, they do make for some <laughs> some better, longer lasting um, mm -hmm. antagonists. Let's say we use a different word. So, Gwen, to you, to wrap that question up, heroes or villains? I'm going to say heroes, and I'm going to say specifically uh, kind of coming-of-age adolescent heroes, like Young Justice, Young Avengers, Spider-Man in high school years, Ms. Marvel more recently. I just love the way in which powers can also be a metaphor for adult responsibility or puberty or all those sorts of things uh and how we get called to make tough choices as we get older just like heroes that's true i mean that's kind of my like, i'm a, a late comer to comics i wasn't a big comics you know person as a kid so when when i first heard of like the, the dc versus marvel debate i figured like how can marvel even compete with dc dc has the superman and the batman like how can anything <laughs> compete with that and then as a, a little more a slightly more mature adult i realized marvel is really where the interesting stories for me are because wow. I, I don't know what i could do for superman right like like, like, like you know lisa mentioned superman before like there's some there's some interesting other better much more talented writers than me have, have done like red sun or when you you know when you when you ask superman like superman why haven't you solved world hunger right like the, you throw a question like that and then they said i think i was in part of that same line when they were doing the alternate you know supermans and, and the one was literally it's like you know, I think I think the Mogadishu issue was like in the news at that time, and so they literally asked him like, "Why haven't you solved it?" And it's like, I bring them food, and then the warlords take. You know, it's like one of those things where it's very similar to human issues, right? Like, why haven't we solved these problems in humanity yet? And just they're complicated, and there's not there's not a. I mean, to me, like the Superman character is less interesting now as an adult than as a kid because there's only one weakness. So when you're writing, there's only, you know, there's only kryptonite. That's the only way that you can really get at that character. Whereas, you know, Mar I, I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll turn it over to you guys so you can respond. I'm, I'm being stupid and naive, but you know, with the, with the, with the, the more Marvel side, you, you, you rarely have the same sort of super push to the limit. There is no other way to get to the people. Um, I, I, mean, I guess Superman, you got to get at him with like family and humanity. Those are the answers, right? But the, um, you know, to, 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 like they're, they're, as, a, as a broken adult versus a kid who wants to be super because you're scared of growing up or you're scared of injury or you're scared of all these other things, like that, the Batman and the Superman appeal to that, like, they're, oh, they're, they're never going to get, they're never going to lose. They're always going to be superheroes. But, um, you know, I think as an adult, we have more cool stories we can tell. So I'll, I'll run it around back to you guys to, uh, and gals to, to talk about, like, what, what are the, how do you do compelling in supers? You know, the, how do you give people amazing powers but still challenge them, still make it relevant to, you know, our human mm -hmm. interests? So I'll start with Brian and we'll go reverse order and we'll get Kevin back on here. So, yeah, I mean, look, I admitted earlier that I'm a Marvel fangirl, but DC, I don't want to – there's plenty of great stories there. And, you know, I grew up – Green Lantern was always one of my favorites growing up, for example. Um, I'm a – I think Superman – can be a really great character because Superman's an, an immigrant alien. Superman's Clark Kent character is actually really interesting. I think I'd love to see a series that focuses on Clark Kent doing investigative journalism and, and trying to solve problems you can't punch your way out of. And of course, Superman's relationships are what are interesting too. Um, so you can tell great stories with those. I mean, whether or not you like the Snyderverse version is a different issue, but you know, those are great. And to make supers compelling, um, so I wanted to just, I'm not a dark DC fangirl, but I wanted to throw that out for the DC fans out there. Um, to make superhero stories compelling, the challenge story-wise, and I bet Lisa's got interesting things to say about this, is uh, tr in traditionally in comics, superheroes are reactive, right? Whereas a fantasy adventure is traditionally, you go on a quest, you have something to do. But superheroes just kind of patrol the neighborhood until something happens and then they react. So the challenge is coming up with things that are like, long-term goals besides maintaining the status quo because that's a weirdly reactionary sort of position to start from so that i think from a narrative point of view is an interesting challenge that supers bring that is a fantastic observation 
The mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'll get back to you on kind of how how that works in in the book so far. Like how do you set those up and, and make a little more more proactive supers? Um, but Lisa, you were you were nodding and shaking your head uh, during the conversation. So weigh in on on the on the great um, you know. Uh, different power levels of supers and how you make it interesting and compelling and all that good stuff. Sure, sure. I, I, I love Gwen's comment about them being reactive. I hadn't thought of it in that light before. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the whole comment, you can't punch your way out of this one, right? Um, so assuming that your role-playing group, your players are into it, you can go much deeper into the interpersonal relationships, right? And there's lots of conflict to be had in... Um, you know, a simple conversation. Um, I've, I've heard some people who teach creative writing say, you know, approach a piece of dialogue like it's a contest. There's a winner and there's a loser, or maybe they compromise. Um, and it's, you know, batting the conversation back and forth. Each has something they want and the other one has something they want that's opposed to that. Um, so a lot of um, drama and ways of losing um, can come out of uh, that process. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun for me to do is, um, although it can kind of break the system a little bit, um, think of all the what ifs, like if superpowers were real, you know, um, what ramifications would there be? If everybody had telepathy, what would happen? Um, and it, you know, speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy um, asks these big questions. Um, and just to riff off this of the Superman thing, there was a super funny um, story uh, written many, many years ago by Larry Niven called, well, more of an essay called Man of Steel, Woman of Kleenex. And so Superman, I don't know if we're keeping this PG-13, but oh, Superman has superpowers. And so he's got super sperm. And so suddenly <laughs> every woman in the planet is impregnated with super babies that can literally kick their way out of the womb. And I was like, yeah, weird, but yeah. Um, weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it can be fun to, uh, you know, some of my early work designing was to think about that. Like, okay, uh, for d d psionics are real. So let's put psionics in the hands of police officers, the town guards, the constables. What does that mean? Nobody can commit a crime anymore. Mm. You know, we know your thoughts. Um, so just the fun of playing around with situations, playing around with the ramifications of superpowers um, and spinning that into stories or possible adventure hooks. Oh, good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, Ace, so after this question, you got to go grab your puppy or at least one or two so you can show up. <laughs> okay. That's great, as we promised. And, um, but the, um, you know, for you, I, here's a question like the, um, are supers, are, are they more appealing because of the humanity or are they more comp compelling because of the, the above humanity, the actual super part? I mean, or are they intrinsic? Are those two things, you know, actually uh, super linkable and, you know. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, definitely a combination of both. I mean, um, it, we, like we were talking about earlier um, with, with kryptonite being Superman's made only weakness. Well, it's not really. He, it's what he cares about and who he loves as well. Um, and those relationships that are very important to the story. You could do so much by dangling those things against him and see what happens. Yeah, no, that's very, no, it's, it's very true. So I'll, I'll admit defeat on this. The, uh, I think you guys have, have <laughs> shown there's, there's more to Superman than just the, uh, the, all the powers in the book plus. The <laughs> right. the um, so, so Kevin in, in, in working on this, this project, the um, you know what what elements do you think are, are in or are are in S five E that allow um, for these kind of these relationships to be built these weaknesses to to be attached to characters um, how does that work in 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 S five E um honestly I've been letting you know Gwen do most of the mechanics I've been okay. mostly concentrating on the fiction but making sure that we have we concentrate on you know everything being possible and everything being focused on the on the characters. Um, I, I think one of the fun things about uh, writing um, the Union of Six and the Legion of Seven is that I'm able to take all of the characters and also uh, uh, <clears throat> all of all of their villains who are heroes in their own stories. Um, and you end up there's actually I think some of the villains are more sympathetic than some of the heroes, but they're working for the big bad 
um, and they don't realize what's going on. So it's a case where you, there's some of them who end up being sort of frenemies, which is a very important part of the superhero genre. I mean, Batman would be far less interesting if Catwoman weren't around. Oh, very true. Very, very true. So, okay, so I, I know a question, next question for Gwen, and we'll ask about kind of those connections and tensions. Um, but as long as I got you on, on the line, Kevin, tell me about the setting. Like, what is Midnight City? What What is, how is that as a character? And, and what, what sort of um, inspirations um, are you using for the setting? And then give me a little bit about that bad guy, because I, I, I kind of want to know some, little, a few little spoilers about um, what those tomes are and, and maybe what, what the, uh, its machinations are in 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 the setting. Okay. Um, well, Umbral is our big bad villain, and uh, he is an ancient Lemurian priest king, and he is actually the one for who is responsible for the sinking of both Atlantis and Lemuria, because he came up with a grand plot to get more power, more power, more ha ha. But since a lot of power <laughs> ends up coming from um, orichalcum, which is this magical metal, um, and various magical star jewels and everything, he had the thing was like, well, we don't have enough here, but it tends to come from asteroid strikes. So we'll just have a few asteroids that will be rich with it um, fall into the ocean. Oh, dear. Everything is a little bit off track, and instead we managed to smack Atlantis and Lemuria and sink them. Um, you know, and is this anything at all like, oh, various, you know, autocrat leaders who, you know, don't listen to their scientists, just listen to their own pet delusions of power? Um, yes. Actually, I've had a, a great deal of fun where uh, one of the villains who is actually not that much a villain is Cirrus, who is this oracle who is pretty much there as Umbral's latest, you know, prophet or prophetess, who is pretty much just telling everything that is wrong, wrong with his plans because, well, he found her and she is going like, well, there's no, I know you'll eventually uh, kill me, but we're going to I'm put this off as long as possible. And I'm just going to be the person who tells you everything that's wrong with your plans. And he's trying to be very, very impressive and says, listen, you screwed up and sank Atlantis and Lemuria. You're not that as competent as you think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how, how, how many continents or islands do you get to sink before you get this, the pink slip, really? I mean, <laughs> right. And, and, and he died in that. And now it's, you know, trying to claw, claw his way back from the shadow world. So he's terribly, terribly powerful, but he's not terribly, terribly competent. I mean, he's just basically what he what he lacks in competence, he makes up for in experience because he's been doing this for so many centuries. He has gotten lots of do-overs. Oh, this is fantastic. And I, I think the little shadow is uh, hinted at in his name uh, from my, my middle school Latin or high school Latin. The um, good stuff. I'm excited. That's a, that's a, that's the kind of villain I think it would be fun to write around and do stories around. And um, so before we get to go ahead, oh, you know, let's go back right to Gwen because it, it, it is a good question about like, you know, it sounds like there's some mechanics that are in, in S5B that allow for the, those connections, the human aspects, the tensions, um, and, and it sounds like you put them right in character creation as well. So you give us a little hint about how, how those work. Sure. Um, so when you create a character, uh, there is an element of we advise you do kind of a session zero to discuss what kind of what kind of game you want. And, you know, that can be questions like, do you want it to be dark and gritty or gross like the boys? Do you want it to be fork, you know, you know, kind of high flying four color. Do you want it to be about teen angsty young justice sort of thing? There's so many different kinds of superhero uh, stories. Do you want it to be about dark magic like Constantine? That's another DC property I love. Um, so, but you also create a connection or tension, one other personality connection with each of the other heroes at, in your team. And then at the end of every subsequent session, you do a brief, a debrief. Uh, it's kind of like a thing you're supposed to do at the end of each game session where you talk a little bit about what went well or poorly during the session, which you want to see more of, but you specifically call out whether you 
did something in the game that leaned on a connection or attention. And doing so gives you either inspiration or a point in that team morale pool for next session. And uh, so that is, and there's, you know, so there's a few mechanics that attach to that. And that allows, that's supposed to, again, incentivize players caring about their characters as people and their relationships with their fellow heroes. Because I happen to, as a, from a game design perspective, I think that if you want players to do something in the game at the table, you need to incentivize it with a mechanic. Otherwise, it's just you know, it's not really in the game. Uh, it might be in the setting or something. Uh, so I want people to care about their characters and their fellow heroes a little bit in the story. So that's kind of part of the mechanic now. See, I, I, I love that. And I, we had a question before that was kind of questioning, oh, is, is 5e the right, the right setting for a, a superhero game? And I, I think all settings should be able to cover multiple genres. I mean, I know there's there's certain mechanics that, that are unique, like mm. Gumshoe and, the, you know, you get a clue kind of thing, which is very on point for those games that might not be used elsewhere. But uh, I, th I think it would be a travesty if, if, if 5e didn't have um, a, a setting in it like S5e where you could do supers and then you could experience mechanics. Like, I mean, I love those connection mechanics. And I think the, the ethic to do those kind of character connection mechanics has come out of some other great RPGs that, you know, that, that have those as their core. Mm -hmm. It's like, why not bring that to, to, to 5e? I mean, I think that's, you know, those are, are so successful in creating dynamicism and connections and player driven story at the table. You know, the, the GM doesn't have to be the only one writing all the and pushing all the narrative. Players can do that. Exactly. Yeah. And just to be clear, like S, there's S5E is there's plenty of other great game systems out there that do heroes. It's just that I found before I sat down to create this is that they're either very crunchy, they require a lot of time and energy up front making characters, min maxing, customizing, which is one experience that some people love. And I too right. love it when I want to play that sort of thing. I'll go play, you know. I don't know if I should name other games. But, Yo, you know, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Like Mutants there. and Masterminds is fantastic at that, but it's based on 3.5 D&D. So if you want a more streamlined experience, but you don't want to go all the way to one that's really just about the relationships and not about powers at all, like masks. Well, 5e is kind of perfectly situated for some levels of crunch and some narrative focus, but there isn't a superhero game that really sits in that Goldilocks middle so that's what I think S5e uh, can do. And it's really out of the box 5e. If you know 5e, this, you can play 99% of the game. It's just it's just two or three mechanics we've added um, to give it that hero feel. Oh, no, and that, 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 that's the way, right? I mean, I think you know, have a Facebook user who agrees that it's, it's you know, you, you need to do something to, to make sure that, like, players who don't know about other systems, right? They, like, I, I really like your design choice on not making it part of the setting, making it part of the crunch. Because that, that'll make people, you know, have to interact with it. And it, it is just a fascinating way to interact with other players. I mean, you, you know, you don't really get in, in, in base, you know, 5 e So um, I love that design choice. Very cool. So, Lisa, um, you mentioned before, you, you dropped a little word, time travel. Um, <laughs> those, there's so many cool things you can do and complications and difficulty there. Um, and the paradoxes will make you insane. <laughs> that's the point. Yeah. So talk about that. Talk about like what it's like to bring that into a system and, and bring it into your writing. Um, the fun part for me, um, I'm a, a real history nerd. You know, I've written fiction in a lot of um, time periods. And, you know, I've, I've my certain go tos that I love, you know, um, the era around the Trojan War, the 1920s um, and teens, um, many of them. Anyways, oh, and so it's <laughs> I love all history. Oh, so yeah. Cool. And it's it's fun to yank people back into those time periods. Um, it was I, I was a huge um, Deadlands player back in the day. And the lovely thing about it was you can just say it's a Western, it's a bar and everyone's got an instant visual. Um, so, you know, assuming you know your history um, or you can, you know, you can Google stuff and pull it up and say, this is what you see. Um, so it's fun to send people back in time. It's fun to get them thinking about that. Oh, but if we go back in time and do this, what ramifications does it have in the here and now? And um, tricky also to design because you have to, you know, it's like, oh, did this whole first adventure we just played not happen now? Um, and, and, and tricky to write because, you know, during the writing process, 
um, I think it was Kevin who pointed out to me, well, if this was like that and they went back in time and did that, doesn't that? And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I now have to fix that. <laughs> so you do a little bit of hand waving, um, both as a designer and as a GM, and you kind of, um, you know, decide how those paradoxes are going to unfold mechanically. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful opportunity to um, present something from history that players can actually Google if they want to and can be encouraged to Google. And they can see how this little bit of real world history marries up with the gaming universe and go, oh, I see why this is happening. Um, so that's a lot of the fun for me. Such goodness. Awesome. So we got only a few minutes left. We will definitely have to do some more panels with you folks because um, S5E is a great property. And um, you know, we, an hour was not enough time. It was not enough time. <laughs> but for, for final thoughts, um, I'll go around starting with Aaron on anything I haven't asked you you want to share yet, um, especially Aaron, your puppies, please. Um, okay. Uh, this this is Max. And this is Madeline. Oh, okay. my God. They're, They're so cute. They're Mad Max for short. <laughs> <laughs> they love oh. they love to wrestle at 3 a.m. and wake us up. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, they're brother and sister. They're oh my god. 13 weeks old. Oh, wow. oh perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks for that share. That was um I think I have diabetes now from the cuteness. Um or you know, or other reasons, but that was that was way too cute. Love them. Um it's gonna be exciting seeing them grow up. So yeah, we'll have to do some more streams so people can just keep track of, you know. The uh, Mad Max and their, okay. their 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 trajectory. So, uh, Kevin, uh, sir, uh, any final thoughts? Anything else you want to share about S five E or your current work, or even stuff outside that you know? Other what else you're doing or Halloween um, before we go? <clears throat> Um, well, honestly, I'm having a lot of fun with the writing. As I said, finishing up uh, Winchester's tale, which is uh, <clears throat> he's our gunslinger. And there is a a tie to Sarah Winchester and the Winchester Mystery House. But <laughs> busy with Halloween weekend, so of course I'm just trying to put the finishing touch on while getting my Halloween on. I was up late with a Halloween party last night, which is uh, my apologies for running a little bit late. It was like 10 o'clock here, but, you know, uh, getting into it, Lisa was also saying about time travel, where <laughs> we've... She, she's gone and touched on some historic stuff, which, of course, I was touching on in my fiction, and so I've we're trying to get sort of a yes, all of the above, where you have different things that happen, but there's other things that don't really contradict them, because historical characters have long lives, and sometimes both things can happen, and it's good to leave things mysterious for the reader's and also for the gamers, because part of the fun of gaming fiction is that the people who are running the games are going to go back and uh, set their own games in the narrative and add their own wrinkles to it. Oh, goodness, goodness. Excellent, excellent. And yes, happy Halloween. The um, So speaking of getting their Halloween on, Gwen, love the horns. And uh, oh, yeah. any final <laughs> thoughts from you on, uh, on Halloween weekend on S5V or any other goodness? Well, I mean, hey, we did give tools in there to play a more horror-focused, uh, Constantine-esque sort of game. There's definitely a whole <laughs> mystical element of that game that I would invite people to explore. Uh, myself, I'm, uh, I'm going to go get my costume already. I'm going to be Velma tomorrow, so I hope uh, you all have a great ha uh, Halloween. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. Okay, last but certainly not least, Lisa, anything else you want to promo? Any other final thoughts on S5E or any Halloween goodness? Um, just want to say how much fun I'm having doing the design work. I love doing collaborative projects. I love working as part of a team. I love, um, you know, thank you to Gwen for all her great design work. And thank you to Kevin. It's just so much fun bouncing <laughs> ideas about which way the story can go um, off of both of you. Um, yeah. So that's it for me. Awesome. Well, you got fans in the audience who uh, love your novels. And uh, so we're going to have to, you, folks, you can pick up S5E. There's links on uh, Pinnacle website. I dropped them in the chat in case you didn't see them. So those are on pre-order now. And uh, we will do this again because you are all amazing. And we hope you have a happy Halloween, which is our, our free um, uh online rpg convention it's all i think everything is sold out so sorry guys if you're just coming check in next year for halloween four 
um, we will definitely get um, some games on. And we will actually probably almost guaranteed have S5E games running at Halloween 4. But definitely more but before then. We don't have to wait a year. Um, the books, uh, again, as, as Aaron said, um, are being printed now, which is super exciting. And um, so, yeah, um, follow Sigil and Pinnacle on uh, the socials for the announcements on when those will be arriving. So you can um, you know when those will be shipping. And uh, we are excited to get our hands on this uh, this great work. And uh, we'll do it. Appreciate you guys coming into chat and every uh, everyone who came in for our panel. We'll have you all back. Appreciate it. So uh, enjoy Halloween, guys, and Halloween uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, stay safe and uh, enjoy rolling those dice. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye.